I'll have a few slides on climate change, but the purpose isn't to convince you that climate change is really happening. I'm guessing most of you realize that, but Marie had asked me to add, add a few words about the climate science on the way in. So I'll do a little bit of that, but this presentation is really focused on how we can address the climate change problem and what we're doing. So uh, this is probably about 10 years ago now. Uh, Max Tyler, who was a state representative, uh, had a workshop uh, on Capitol Hill, downtown Denver, uh, for the state legislature. And it was on climate change. And he asked me to address all the skeptic arguments, or at least the main ones. And I did that. I kind of said, here's the argument. Here's why it's not right. I'm not going to do that today. But, but I did want to start with one thing that you hear a lot, and that is, Look, the, the climate is, is always changed. It gets warmer, it gets colder. This has happened throughout the Earth's history. What's the big deal? That, so that's one thing I would like to address. And I'd say, yeah, that's true, but. And there's a big but. And if you look at the temperature of the planet Earth here, uh, and you can see the history of the planet going back millions of years. In fact, it's been warmer, it's been colder, and the Earth changes. Um, but what happened when dinosaurs were ruling the Earth really doesn't have too much relevance to us today. And so I want to focus you on that period of time, the last 10,000 years. So you, the human species, our species, Homo sapiens, has been around for 200,000 years, okay? It's only in the last 5% of the time we've been on the Earth that we've developed agriculture, civilization. Why is that? Because during that period, we came out of the last glacial period, sea level rose greatly, and we got to this very stable temperature regime. This is really the Goldilocks period. We've gone for the last 10,000 years for this very steady temperature period. All life on Earth, us, all life on Earth, is adapted to this very steady Goldilocks climate. And what we're doing is we're taking ourselves dramatically out of that by putting all this carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that absorbs outgoing infrared radiation, okay? It's like putting a blanket on you that heats you up. And so we're looking, by the end of the century, as much as eight degree Fahrenheit increase in temperature. Uh, that, that's not, it's not just a little bit outside this Goldilocks period, it just blows it out of the water. That's a different planet, a totally different planet that we're heading toward. So basically, since we started burning fossil fuels, we've, we've increased the amount of carbon dioxide, uh, a, again, a powerful uh, infrared energy absorbing gas, uh, by about 45%. Now, carbon dioxide goes through these cycles typically of 100,000 years. It's higher now than it's been in 3 million years, and it's going up at this incredible rate. So I was born in the middle of last century, 1950, I'm dating myself here, since I was born, it's increased 25%. That means that the air that we're all breathing right now has 25% more carbon dioxide in it than when I took my first breath as a baby back in 1950. That's an incredible fundamental change in the atmosphere of this planet. Okay, so I, I want to say that I showed what happens mid-century. I showed what we're, where we're looking at for 2100. That's the future, but this is happening now. We have all these extreme weather events. I've heard people say, it's the new normal. I don't like the phrase, the new normal. You know why? Because the new normal suggests that we've come to a new steady state. We haven't come to a new steady state. It's changing every second. It's really the new abnormal. That's what we're seeing. So I just have a few examples here. Uh, East African drought uh, killed uh, greater than a quarter million people. Extreme precipitation events all over the place. I grew up on Long Island. Uh, August uh, 12, 2014, they had 13 inches of rain in 24 hours. That, that's just unheard of, that kind of rain on Long Island. Seawater flooding regularly at, at King Tides in Miami. That's a picture I took in Rocky Mountain National Park. You, you, you go up to Rocky Mountain National Park, there's dead trees everywhere due to bark beetle kill, due to drought and due to the, the fact that the winters have become much warmer. Record heat in the Gulf fueled Hurricane Harvey's deluge. So what we're seeing is the Arctic has warmed so much that the temperature difference between the mid-latitudes and the Arctic has decreased. That's totally changing weather patterns. It's slowing down the jet stream. It's causing storms not only to have more energy but to move more slowly. And so we see these storms that dump all sorts of rain. 
This one study said, climate change likely increased the chances of the observed rainfall in Houston by a factor of at least 3.5. And now we see what's happening in North South Carolina. These are unprecedented events. They have enormous economic consequences. This is from last year. The Thomas Fire became the largest in California's history. That's a year ago. That was in December. December is the minimum month for wildfires in California. To set the record in December was just unheard of. And guess what? Here we are one year later, and the Mendocino Fire has broken the record of the Thomas Fire. Carl bleaching. <clears throat> you know, bleaching occurs in small areas uh, around the world. What's new is we're now seeing, at one time, global coral bleaching events. So basically, whenever there's an El, Ni El Nino in the Pacific, we're now seeing these global events. So 1998, 2010, 2015, massive death of coral. Northern part of the Great Barrier Reef, great loss of coral, complete mortality of a lot of that coral. Have any of you seen the film Chasing Coral? It's on Netflix. Terrific. Um, I think it's a wonderful film, and it really emphasizes what's happening to coral around the world. Um, I, I love coral. I've been diving since I was a teenager. Uh, and in my lifetime, I've seen an incredible change. There are places, uh, for example, I dived the Great Barrier Reef in 1982. I won't go back there because I have in my head my memory of what, it, what Lady Elliot Island was like in the Great Barrier Reef, and I don't want to see it again. I know it's not the same. So some estimates are by mid-century, 90% mortality of coral reefs. One out of four marine species depend on coral reefs, and yet we're losing them. It's incredible. So there are economic consequences to this. If you look, this shows you billions of dollars uh, of, of, of disaster costs. Um, and you can see here the various years. And basically, all the colored lines up here to get very high costs are since 2004. Now, skeptics will say, well, you know, people are building homes closer to the ocean and this and that. Yeah, but that can't explain this absolutely enormous increase. What this is due to is these extreme weather events. So what do we need to do? We can't stop completely climate change. In fact, even if we stopped emitting all carbon dioxide today, there's probably another one degree Fahrenheit or so temperature rise that's built in. It's in the pipeline. We have to adapt. There's lots of ways we can adapt. Uh, because of time constraints, I'm not going to cover adaptation today. Uh, but cities, uh, mayors, uh, states are taking various measures to try to adapt to drought, to heat waves, to extreme precipitation events. So I want to co cover the transformation. That's what we really need to do. The goal is pretty obvious. We just we have to stop emitting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's as simple as that, okay? We have to get to zero emissions as, cool, as quickly as we can. In fact, we even have to go beyond that, and I'll cover that later. <clears throat> so what are the options? Carbon capture and storage, if we want to keep uh, doing this, we have to capture the, the, the carbon and store it. Uh, nuclear power, uh, this is not an easy thing to do. It's expensive. When you, when you capture the carbon, uh, your, your, your plant efficiency goes down. Uh, there are debates about how much, uh, how safe the storage is, although geologists, a lot of them are pretty convinced we can store CO2 for a long period. Nuclear power, there's about 99 <coughs> operating nuclear power plants in the U.S. Um, I think we need to keep those operating. They reduce, the, they handle about 20% of U.S. electricity. They save a lot of carbon. In terms of building new nuclear power plants, at least in the United States, as you'll see in a chart later, they're really, really expensive, much more expensive than renewable energy. So these are the two that I like to focus on, efficiency and renewables. And this is the uh, uh, International Energy Agency, and these are their projected energy investments in order to stay below two degrees temperature, temperature rise compared to pre-industrial. So what you can see is uh, efficiency is the biggest investment followed by renewables, a little bit carbon capture and storage, CCS, and a little bit on nuclear, but dominated by efficiency and renewables. I led a study for the American Solar Energy Society about 10 years ago, and when we looked at <clears throat> ways to reduce carbon, 
57% of our measures uh, were uh, uh, efficiency and the rest were renewables. When you look at efficiency, the real key is building efficiency to decarbonize. If you really look at all the buildings out there in the United States, this is a US plot, and you uh, include buildings, for example, that house office people that are in, in the industrial sector, and you include those in the building sector, it turns out buildings are responsible for about 45% of US carbon emissions. So what we do with buildings is really important. As you know, in China and other places around the world, buildings are going up like crazy. If we don't build those buildings right, we have no hope of addressing climate change. So this is an example of uh, how it's done right. Um, this is at NREL. I spent just under 40 years working at NREL. I retired recently. Um, and I actually retired so I could spend more time giving talks like this and, and doing various other things on the climate change issue. Um, but this is the main office building on the NREL campus, just a, a, a mile and a half or so from here. It's the na nation's largest net zero energy office building. What does that mean? It means that there's enough on-site renewable energy generated to equal the amount of energy this building uses on an annual basis. How do we accomplish that? <clears throat> well, we set an energy goal. 25,000 BTUs of square foot of energy use per year. That's per square foot of floor area, 360,000 square feet in this building. That was the goal, <clears throat> and we went out to uh, architects and builders and said, you guys have to come in as a team. It's not, a, not, not good enough for the architect to say, yeah, we're gonna meet this energy goal and hand it to a builder that says, that's too expensive, we can't do that. You guys have to come in as a team, and you're gonna be contractually ob obligated to do this. Guess what, when someone signs a contract says we're gonna do that, they do it. And the cost of this building was about 260 bucks a square foot, which is typical for an office building in, in Denver. So that 25,000 BTUs a square foot is about half the energy use of a code, uh, latest code energy efficient building in Colorado. So we cut the energy use in half. That doesn't make it net zero. We still have to add PV. But see, here are some of the things we did. Lots of daylighting, solar tubes, um, you know, Denver has large temperature swings in the summertime. We have lots of internal mass in this building. Hot summer day, gets cold at night. The windows open, cold air blows through the building, cools all that thermal mass down. Radiant ceilings, there are various advantages of that I won't go into. Uh, in the wintertime, <clears throat> all the ventilation air for the building is preheated by this solar collector. <clears throat> but in order to make this building net zero, and this is the building here, there's three wings, so you can see it right in the middle. It's got uh, 857 kilowatts of PV on the three rooftops, uh, which did very well in the hailstorm a year ago, by the way. I only saw one broken panel on the roof up here. Um, and then an, about a, a little over a megawatt on the main parking garage and about half a megawatt on the visitor canopy. We have to use those three, that's about two and a half megawatts, to make this building net zero. So the other thing I want to say is that because buildings are so important, NREL spent a lot of time developing building energy modeling tools. And a lot of these are actually available to you, and I'm going to cover a couple of those and make you aware of them. This is called BOPT, <clears throat> and with BOPT, you can, t you can model your own home. So there's a website right there, uh, BOPT.NREL.gov, download it for free. You can model your house, and you can look at well, gee, what happens if I increase my attic insulation to R40? Or what happens if I put in better windows? And essentially, what this plot shows is that, you know, this is the total cost of, let's say you take out a loan to make an energy efficiency measure. It costs you money, but it saves you on your utility bill. Add those two together, and you can find the most efficient measures actually decrease your total cost until you get less efficient measures, and eventually you get back to where you started from. So in this example, you can be sort of cost neutral, saving like 57% of your energy. And then if you want to go to net zero, you got to add PV. Yeah, I mean, you could get it from a solar garden or a central, but you, but you could add PV to your roof. And one of the things that's really changed, it's really interesting, PV has gotten so cheap in cost that the slope of that curve is coming down. And the intersection point's moving to the left. So we used to say, 
Do everything you can with energy efficiency on a house before you think about putting PV on your roof. PV's gotten so inexpensive now that it's cheaper than some energy efficiency measures. And this has created some havoc with the Department of Energy. They have two different departments and they're, they're kind of competing against, well, gee, you know, should we push efficiency? Should we push PV? And so there's a lot of debate about where this intersection occurs now. So there's another tool that's been developed, <clears throat> and this is for uh, retrofit applications. It's called ResStock, residential building stock. And they used a supercomputer at NREL um, and looked at uh, climate locations all over the US, and they looked at what measures make the most sense to retrofit in homes. And this was a function of the local climate. Uh, it's a function of how old the house is. An old house, a really old house, may not have any attic insulation, for example. It's a function of whether the house uses electricity or uses natural gas, what that costs locally. So this is a study, the whole United States, there were just millions of data points in here. And they came up with maps, and they come up with uh, you know, rating us uh, how much source energy is saved for, di for different measures. And they also came up with a map for every state. And yes, there's one for Colorado. And so <clears throat> if you want to see the map of Colorado, you just go to uh, resstock, R-E-S-S-T-O-C-K dot N-R-E-L dot gov, and you'll see this map. And it shows you what measures make the most sense here. So obviously it depends, you know, this is kind of a generic thing, uh, but you can see uh, uh, drill and fill wall cavity insulation uh, can make a lot, a lot of sense. Uh, LED lighting. Uh, there are, there's a few, not many homes in Colorado have electric furnaces where that the air is heated electrically, electric resistance heating, but certainly in those cases, uh, replacing it with a heat pump makes a lot of sense. So it depends on where you are. The city of Boulder has used these results to great use. Uh, what they've done is they've actually, for different parts of Boulder County, depending on the elevation, they look at what measures make the most sense, and they've actually communicated that to vendors. And they give vendors the information and say, hey, you're selling heat pump hot water heaters? Here's where you should sell them, because here's where they really make economic sense. <clears throat> All right, so energy efficient buildings make sense, but if we want to save our, our country, our planet from climate change, it's too slow to do this one building at a time. So we've really focused in the last two years on zero carbon districts, scaling up. And we got a couple of years of internal funds at NREL to develop this capability. And what we developed is a cool to uh, tool called Urban Opt that allows you to model an entire district and make that whole district zero carbon emitting. And these are just a couple example uh, early screenshots, but one of the things you can do is when you lay out buildings in a new district, you can lay them out in such a way that it actually, minute by minute throughout the year, it looks at the shading from one building to another. So you can lay out buildings in a way that maximize your solar exposure of your rooftop uh, to give you the most from photovoltaic cells. <clears throat> also, it's not unusual to have one building that needs cooling while another building needs heating. Urban Op allows you to identify that and move heat between buildings, very efficient. And so these are various districts, zero carbon districts that are under development across the United States. Uh, the top three are right here in, uh, in, uh, in the Denver area, and I'll, I'll say just a little bit more about some of those. Uh, so basically, Denver voters a couple of years ago approved uh, expansion of the uh, National Western Center beyond just the stock show, redeveloping 130 acres. Um, and one of the things that's interesting about that, um, there's uh, two six-foot diameter sewage lines running right through the property. That can, that can really so serve as a, s a source and sink for heat pumps. So for example, the city of Vancouver, all the downtown buildings are heated with hot water, that there's big GE heat pumps that are located in the, uh, in the uh, uh, sewage treatment plant. They pull about, uh, about they, they lower the temperature of the sewage by about eight degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and that is enough to get high temperature, 140 degree Fahrenheit water to pump to all the buildings. This is the Denver Sun Valley neighborhood, not Sun Valley, Idaho, but this is the, the, this is the lowest income neighborhood in Denver. So if you're ever, for example, if you ever ride the uh, uh, Platte River bike path and you head south from REI, pretty soon on your right side, you'll see the buildings uh, in the Sun Valley neighborhood. 
So the Denver Housing Authority got a grant from HUD, about $30 million, and they're redoing, re, uh, redoing that district. They're gonna make it a third public housing, um, a third low-income housing, and a third market-rate housing, and they're targeting that to be a, a net-zero district. And then Pena Station um, is a joint project of Panasonic and Excel, and NREL is involved, and that's, uh, that, that's the first stop uh, out of uh, DIA. Uh, that we're working with, and that's going to be basically a, uh, um, a district by itself. I've, those are all new districts, and I should point out that urban op can also be used for uh, redevelopment. So this is an example in California. This is a low-income neighborhood in Huntington Beach, California, and it's been modeled with urban opt, uh, where we can get uh, basically uh, the uh, uh, net positive energy, get get the energy use uh, negative, essentially, um, and make it positive in terms of renewables. So that's a, that's a, a redevelopment project. <clears throat> All right, so I, I made the point that buildings are so responsible for carbon emissions. Again, that number like 45%. But the other thing too, what we're really trying to do is electrify, because with wind and PV and photovoltaics, uh, you can see they've dropped so much in cost that if we can use electricity from renewables, we can greatly reduce carbon emissions. The problem is both solar photovoltaics and wind power are variable. Obviously, the wind, the wind doesn't blow all the time, the sun doesn't, doesn't shine at night, doesn't shine when the clouds come in the way. So they're variable. So how do you handle that? Well, one way you can handle it is look at where the electricity is used, and if you can control how and when it's used, you can better match the variable supply. So in the US, about 75% of our electricity is used in buildings. So that's the place to really focus on to control it. And it's called demand response and it, that's what we're looking at. So basically if you have proper building energy management, you save energy and you support all this variable solar photovoltaics and wind power on the grid. So there's about, about $120 million building energy systems integration facility that was built in NREL. This is one of the labs, the system performance lab. And in that lab, there are three different homes that are modeled with advanced appliances, uh, uh, rooftop PV, electric car, et cetera. And we've developed an, a home energy management system uh, that allows that uh, building to be controlled in a way that uh, it basically is uh, grid friendly to renewables. Now, this is a little complicated graph. I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to give you an overview of it. But this is a computer simulation of a case, and this is actually for the Pacific Northwest, where the utility sends out a signal early in the day that the forecasts show they expect high loads during this four hour period from 5 to 9 p.m. What's a load? What's that? A load. The, so the load is the amount of, electri amount of electricity that, that, is, uh, that the utility has to provide. So they know the load's gonna go up because people are gonna be running their air conditioners during that period from five to nine, okay? Demand, basically. Demand? Yeah, uh-huh, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, all right, so that's the amount of electric electricity they have to supply. They're gonna have trouble because they know everybody's gonna be turning on their air conditioners, it's gonna be, you know, they get home from work, five to nine, they have to provide that electricity. So what can this home do about that? Well, it can pre-cool the building, all right? And you can incentivize this, okay? You can incentivize it by having time of, time of use electricity pricing that incentivizes this. But essentially, if you pre-cool the house, it allows you to float more through that period. It's sort of like what I said with our, our office building where we actually bring in cold night air. In this case, you're running the air conditioning compressor early, you're cooling the house below where it would ordinarily be cooled. The other thing you can do is reschedule the appliances. The other thing you could do is take all the electricity off the grid and off rooftop PV and make sure your battery, your home battery is fully charged and in this simulation there's a home battery. If you do all that, then during this period when electricity is gonna be highly valued and when the, the utility is looking for help in shedding load, you'd get 14 kilowatt hours of reduction. About eight kilowatt hours come from fully discharging that battery that you charged up beforehand during that four hour period. But another six kilowatt hours comes from these shifts in the building load. Pre-cooling the building, scheduling the appliances, et cetera. So all those things can help. 
And I just want to mention another thing we're really have done at NREL is look at, at manufactured, factory built manufactured housing. There's a number of advantages to that. Uh, if, if you look, uh, this is uh, near 33rd and F Federal, Elliott Street. There's 40 units uh, called the Elliott Flats. These are all factory uh, ma uh, manufactured apartment units. Uh, they are uh, uh, one, uh, one bedroom and studio. And we actually had one manufactured for us <coughs> in a champion factory uh, in uh, York, Nebraska. This is our unit being manufactured, and this is it installed in a high bay laboratory at NREL. And we're doing various things to um, improve its efficiency and improve its demand profile in terms of when it uses electricity. All right, so that's all buildings, but ultimately we need this renewable electricity. And I just want to just quickly run through some of those. So wind power, wind has gotten really cheap. Why has it gotten really cheap? Because turbines have gotten much taller and then they get to much higher wind speeds. And the, the, the power you get from the wind goes up very, very rapidly as wind speed goes up. One of the problems is we've addressed a, a limit in terms of transporting these big turbines. So that shows you an 80 meter long turbine blade. Uh, they're trying to get around a, a right hand turn. It's getting tough. Um, and, and down there you can see the hubs you know, that, that, uh, that go you know, between the blades. Um, fitting those under uh, freeway overpasses has become a problem. We've, we've sort of reached the limit on that. And so NREL's doing some work on can we do on-site manufacturing of wind turbines? The other thing is that what researchers have found is that when you go into wind farms, the wake of one turbine can affect the performance of downstream turbines. So how can you uh, optimize these wind farms in a way that maximizes the total output from the whole wind farm? And there's a lot of CFD, that's computational fluid dynamic analysis, being done to figure out how to lay these turbines out in a way that maximizes the wind farm energy. Solar photovoltaics, uh, again, uh, thanks to uh, uh, Chinese investment, uh, uh, PV modules have become very cheap in the United States and around the world. One thing that's being done, there's a lot of interest in these so-called perovskite cells around the world. Why is that? Well, one thing is that they can be made in roll-to-roll -roll processing and really mass manufactured. That's the attraction. Um, they're not really durable enough yet. They're not quite as efficient as crystalline silicon, maybe 15%. But the argument is people that are looking for these large deployments of, of photovoltaics, like 25 trillion watts in the world, they're saying to do that, we need something like this that we can mass manufacture. It would take too long using conventional crystalline silicon. And then concentrating solar power, this is the idea that um, <clears throat> in, the, in the southwest United States where we have very clear skies, um, you can concentrate solar energy, boil water like you would with coal or natural gas, and, and run a steam turbine. And this is a, a plant, it's a 110 megawatt plant in uh, Nevada, it's called the Crescent Dunes plant, and it has 10 hours of molten salt thermal storage. So this is a case where it's more what they call dispatchable, where that electricity uh, can be dispatched whenever because it's not just when the sun shines, they can, they can store it in that, those uh, storage tanks. And then NREL's done a lot of work on this. How do you, how do you get all these different so-called independent system operators and utilities? How can you move electricity between these different system operators depending on where the sun is shining, depending on where the wind is blowing? And the, the bigger the area you can control, the more flexibility you have. And they've done an analysis of the whole eastern grid of the United States. All right, so look, there's some really good news, and that is when it comes to renewables, the train has really left the station. Things are really finally happening. You know, if you look at the early 20th century, of course, we made this transition from the horse and buggy to, uh, to the automobile. Early 21st century, we got central coal generated electricity, and now we're moving toward a combination of central electricity, uh, PV on your, on your roof, uh, running electric cars. This is probably the most optimistic graph that I've seen. This is from Tony Steba at Stanford, uh, looking at how quickly we might see electric vehicles take over. Um, he views this as happening very rapidly because he thinks we're going to quickly go to transportation as a service. Um, you're going to have autonomous vehicles. 
uh, this debate about how quickly autonomous vehicles can really penetrate, but this is probably the most uh, aggressive that I've seen in terms of uh, electric vehicle penetration. These are autonomous Chevy Bolts. General, General Motors is putting a fair amount of effort into uh, looking at uh, uh, autonomous bolts for fleets. And just to give you an idea how quickly transitions can occur, uh, these are photos of Fifth Avenue in New York, 1900 on the left, 1913 on the right. You can see on the left, it's all horse and buggy. On the right, it's virtually all automobiles. That's just a 13-year period. So there, there, there are precedents uh, for these very, very rapid transitions. This is the exponential growth <coughs> of renewable electricity. You can see wind, um, and th this is a... Um, uh, a semi-log plot, uh, and so these are, these are really exponential growths that are going on. And you can see worldwide, this is a worldwide plot, uh, solar photovoltaics, you know, wind really was out in the lead, but solar photovoltaics is really, really approaching wind. And these are some uh, recent costs from a company named Lazard that, that keeps track of these. And you can see um, the numbers here are, are dollars per megawatt hour, so at the bottom, you can see um, uh, wind uh, down there at, at $45 uh, per megawatt hour. That's like four and a half cents per kilowatt hour. Um, and you can see, I mentioned before how expensive nuclear is. You can see nuclear is way up here at the top. It's very hard for new nuclear power plants to compete. But wind and solar are getting very inexpensive. And there was a lot of news about Excel getting recent bids in Colorado for wind and solar with battery storage down around two to four cents per kilowatt hour. So the, some of these bids are coming in extremely low. In terms of uh, where the uh, job growth is, uh, this is a, a plot, this is from a DOE report, and it shows you the amount of people that work in the coal industry, the amount of people that work in the solar industry. Uh, this is where the jobs are really in renewables and efficiency. And the good news is, even though I think a lot of us have been disappointed by what's happening at the federal level, there's a lot going on. Corporations, states, cities are re really leading this transition. So these are corporations that support climate action, been very vocal about that. Uh, my son works at Google, you know, they, their headquarters has gone 100% renewable. These so-called climate alliance states that have agreed to uh, meet the Paris Agreement. Uh, Colorado was one of those. California in particular, this is a new headline, California sets a goal of 100% clean electric power by 2045. So um, Governor Brown just signed this bill and also gave an executive order that the whole state is gonna be completely carbon neutral by that time. These are various climate mayors that have signed on to meet the Paris Accord. China uh, is, uh, has very, very aggressive uh, renewable energy targets, been really leading. Uh, the charge on this. They see this as a real economic opportunity in addition, of course, to having to address their air pollution issues. I was over there back in March and the pollution problem there is still very serious. They've, they've moved away from using coal for home heating, but they still are using a lot of coal for uh, electricity generation. One thing I want to point out is um, when people point to China, and China now has more annual emissions than the U.S. does. They surpassed us a few years ago. Um, but th this shows you carbon dioxide flows from the generation of emissions to where the goods are consumed. And you can see all these goods moving from China to the U.S. So you could say, boy, the U.S. is doing great in reducing our carbon emissions. Well, yeah, it's because we outsourced our carbon emissions to China. And really, ultimately, we're, we all share the same atmosphere. So the purpose is to get the carbon dioxide down in the entire atmosphere. It doesn't help us to shift away and, and export our emissions. Race for renewable energy domination. This shows you who's really investing in renewables, and you can see China really has the lead here. So in the past, when I've given climate change presentations, I've sort of touted what China's doing with, with some optimism. And occasionally I'll have somebody in the audience raise their hand and I say, yeah, but what about India? Because India burns lots of coal. Um, and, and I think there are some real hopeful signs in, in India. So Prime Minister Modi um, uh, basically uh, has signed on to this idea of an international solar alliance. Uh, this is the French Prime Minister uh, meeting with him, agreeing to invest in it. So India is... Uh, uh, 
uh, very uh, high on renewables now. This is a study that was done by the analysts at NREL showing uh, by India by 2022 is looking at 100 gigawatts of solar, uh, 100,000 megawatts of solar, 60,000 megawatts of wind. And this is a, a map showing how that would be laid out. So I was in India last week. So the, basically, the state of Colorado is developing a memorandum of understanding with a, a western state. Uh, in India, it's called Gujarat, and it's the home state of Prime Minister Modi. And the idea is to collaborate on developing renewable energy efficiency, that sort of thing. And so an MOU was signed, I spent three days over there, and uh, we hope something comes out of that. You know, often these things, there's a celebration, and then what really matters is what do you make out of it, so we, we hope this, this leads to a lot of good things. But I just thought I'd show you a picture from last week. This is a one uh, installation we visited. This is a one megawatt PV application. So this is over a canal. Uh, in India, you know, India is a very populous country, obviously. Um, and uh, land is very expensive there. And so by putting the PV over this canal, they save on land costs. At the same time, they shade the canal and they reduce evaporative loss from the water. So I thought it was an interesting uh, application. Um, I really like this writer, David uh, Roberts. He writes for Vox, and, and he's, um, I think, has a real good handle on the climate change issue and renewable energy, what's happening with the energy field. And when he says there's a revolution in clean energy, but it's not happening fast enough, that's the truth. And so, for example, if you look at the, the various pledges that came out of Paris and you look at uh, emissions versus time, you can see we, we really need to be down here, okay? And essentially, if everybody met their pledges, we'd be coming in at 2.6 to 3.2 degrees Celsius temperature rise above the 2C goal. And I think at 1C temperature rise, we know we have all these extreme weather events, so one can argue you know, the 2C goal really traces back to a 1975 paper by a Yale economics professor, William Nordhaus, who said, well, let's say we can tolerate 2 degrees C. There's never real science behind it. People have adopted it because they think, well, maybe it's achievable. But the point is, uh, people are not meeting their pledges. So we're not even on this path. So we do have a lot of work to do. That's the truth. And finally, reducing carbon emissions isn't enough. We have waited too long to reduce carbon emissions. We have to go carbon negative. So if you look at the various paths to get us even to meet the 2 degree C target, ultimately, all these various paths wind up going carbon negative. How do you do that? You can do bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. I know we have advocates of biochar. Um, there's various things that you can do. Obviously, uh, afforestation, where you, you build forests where they haven't been there before, reforestation. There's lots of things you can do to get carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. You can do direct capture. Um, uh, there, there's some uh, companies working on that. But ultimately, we're going to have to figure out ways to actually extract CO2 out of the atmosphere. So look, climate change is a planetary emergency. And I wanted to give a couple examples of how, how historically we've addressed emergencies. This is 1944. <clears throat> this is a Ford Motor Company plant, Willow Run, Michigan plant. It produced one B-24 bomber every 63 minutes, uh, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This is a former automobile factory. There's B-24 bombers as far as the eye can see. This is what this country is capable of doing if we treat something like an emergency. We have not done that with climate change yet. There's a lot of political resistance. You know, I think as a, as a country, I think we have a good reputation of when our backs are up against the walls and we have an emergency, uh, we can handle it. Um, it's all of us, and we're on this spaceship going through space and we have 45% more carbon dioxide in our atmosphere than when we started burning all these fossil fuels, and now we're getting all these extreme weather events, and it's not an exaggeration, it's not hyperbole to say that this is an emergency and we're not treating it like that, and we need to start doing that. So thanks for listening. <laughs> So in terms of carbon, uh, taking carbon out of the air, uh, 
you mentioned forestation, and, and does that include a lot of agricultural possibilities? I was thinking of drawdown, um, those options there. Yeah, so, uh, you know, be, being an engineer that worked at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, I, I tend to focus on the energy part of the problem, the fact that, you know, how do we replace fossil fuels with uh, renewables? Uh, but yes, agriculture can make a real difference. Um, you know, soils can really sequester uh, carbon dioxide. If you go to, for example, to uh, no-till farming where you're not tilling the soil and not bringing the carbon out, uh, there's various things you can do. Obviously, um, there are things you can do um, in, in terms of... Uh, yeah, I, I've even read an article recently that um, I think everybody knows that the cows uh, uh, generate methane from burping, and so there have been recent studies where they can mix a very tiny uh, percentage of algae into the into the feed, the cattle feed, and the and the amount of methane that gets produced goes way down. Um, so yes, I mean I, I'm no expert in, in agriculture, uh, but yes, how we produce our food. Obviously, if we moved away from beef. Uh, and all became vegetarians, uh, that would be a good thing, but it's, it's not easy to get you know, people to make that kind of change. Um, but yeah, I think we have to look at land use. We have to look again at, <clears throat> we, we can't be destroying these forests. I think people know that in Indonesia, for example, there's real incentive to burn down rainforests, to, to, to plant uh, oil palms. Uh, that's very destructive to the environment. Uh, so we're really looking for you know, increasing the number of forests by, by b putting forests where they aren't now or reforesting re um, and also looking at better agricultural techniques. Yeah. Hi, Chuck. Um, I'm David Cockrell from Pueblo. Um, Hi. <laughs> so can you, uh, what, what are some of the, what do you think are some of the most important next policy developments or policy changes in Colorado that we need to adopt in order to facilitate this transition uh, in, the inter in the electric sector from fossil fuels to renewables? Po policy changes, say at the PUC or the legislature or other places. Okay. Um, well, you know, when I was an NREL employee, I wasn't supposed to advocate for policies. Um, but but now, now I'm not. And look, I mean, there's, there's a great group of people um, uh, you know, the citizens' uh, climate lobby that are, that are advocating basically for uh, carbon tax, um, you know, as, as Jim Hansen puts it, a fee and dividend, um, where all the money gets returned to the people. Um, there are cases, uh, you know, I think when, when um, Australia had a carbon tax, they, they actually saw a drop in emissions. So I think a tax, uh, California has its cap and trade policy, so I think something that, that prices carbon in a way that's commensurate with the environmental damage can help. Um, you know, Colorado has done a really good job with its renewable portfolio standards. You know, uh, we, we were not the first state to have a renewable portfolio standard, but we were the first state uh, that it came from the citizens, not from the state legislature. The state legislature has since upped it, and we're doing very well with that. Although I was a little surprised, I guess, that uh, I, I just saw a list of the 10 top states with solar and uh, Colorado's not, not in that list. Um, so, you know, anything we can do to advocate more, more solar, um, you know, and I, I think uh, a combination of rooftop solar, uh, solar gardens, uh, central solar, the utilities, of course, prefer central solar. That's a big debate in the country right now about, you know, utilities wanna keep doing stuff on their side of the meter. Um, and, and there are arguments for that, uh, but, I think climate change is such a crisis, we need to do it all. We need to put it on rooftops, we need to put it in gardens, we need to put it central. Uh, so anything we can do to, to push all those things. Uh, other than that, you know, I haven't um, sat down recently and said, gee, of all the different policies, you know, what are the ones that uh, make the most sense? One thing that helps is consistent policies. You know, you see these ups and downs, you know, based, uh, for example, on the production tax credit for wind. You know, if it's not going to be renewed, you, you know, you, you see people hesitant. They want to make sure that it's in there. So consistency is important so people can plan ahead. So whatever policies we have, it's important to be consistent. Yeah. Do we need leadership or do we need to get all the people to have a sense of planetary emergency? Or do you just work both ends on that? Because it seems to me that 
that's the, the revolution is happening way too slowly. Yeah. You know, um, there, there are a lot of reasons. Uh, you, know, you know, there are people doing PhD theses in psychology, right, on why we're not treating this like an emergency. Um, you can't see CO2, that's part of the problem. It's, it's a slow moving emergency. Um, it doesn't make the news because it's always getting worse, so it's not a completely new event every day, right? Um, but also a big part of it is there is a sophisticated, well-funded disinformation campaign out there. Uh, and a lot of money has been put into it. There's a guy named Robert Brule uh, at Drexel that's done some good reports on it. And sometimes in my slide presentations, I'll cover the disinformation campaign. And one of the things I like that he has is, it's like a spider diagram. And it shows how money has been funneled, funneled through all these different organizations, basically by the fossil fuel industry, to support misinformation on climate change. Um, and, and, you know, these people are, they're good at advertising, right? They, and they know how to do focus groups, so it's a, it's a sophisticated effort. Um, one of the things I got a kick out of, this is probably about five years ago, they were circulating this thing, well, you know, the volcanoes put more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than humans do. And, and people really took off with that. Well, first of all, it's completely untrue. The US Geological Survey sur did a study, and they basically found out we put in at that time, 135 times as much CO2 into the atmosphere as volcanoes do. Um, and the other problem is volcanoes emit a lot of sulfur dioxide. So actually, if you look at Mount Pinatubo when it interrupted in 19, erupted in 1991, you, you saw a decrease in the solar and cooling for the next year and a half. So, but, but people, you know, they, they know what to tell people that they go, oh yeah. Um, I remember, I, sometimes I've told audiences, um, I would say our most famous climate scientist, and they just celebrated the 30th anniversary of him uh, uh, giving a, a, a testimony to Congress, which really got people aware. This is in 1988. Uh, but Jim Hansen, who for many years was director of the Goddard Institute for Space, Space Studies. And what I tell people is, look, <clears throat> this guy got his PhD in physics, physics from the University of Iowa in James Van Allen's group, Van, a Van Allen radiation belt. I mean, this is a a prestigious physics department. He's been studying climate change for his whole life. He's an expert. You imagine knocking on his door, going into his office and saying, hey Jim, volcanoes. You ever think of volcanoes? <laughs> and Jim Hansen goes, ah, I can't believe I never thought of that. So a lot of these skeptic arguments they put out there to buy them, you have to believe that our best American scientists are complete idiots. Uh, but this is the kind of stuff that they feed people, and, and it's not easy. And, and part of the problem is we in the scientific community are not expert communicators. You know? I mean, that's, that's not our field. Um, and so I think we have to do a better job at that. The other thing that really surprises me is watch ads, political ads, all right? How many of them are based on fear? And you remember like when, they were, when Dukakis was running and they had you know, uh, you know, somebody coming out of prison and all this? Fear is often used to sell things. And what they tell us is, don't give people bad news about climate change. It, you know, it just turns them off. You, you can't do that. But in fact, political movements are often based on fear. So people sell made up fears. And we're afraid to communicate genuine fear. And I think we have to think more about that as well. Go ahead. Uh, this isn't a question, this is just a comment. I have uh, a Bolt, uh, Chevrolet Bolt EV, and I, on the roads, see so few electric yeah. automobiles. And uh, my friends said, oh, but you're gonna, your, your electric bill's gonna go out of the sky. Not true. I was spending about $50 a month on my little Honda with about the same kind of yeah, yeah. Uh, driving. Yep. And our electric bill go, went up about $15 a month. Yeah. So it, it's not more expensive. It's fun to drive and it's just a, a great little car. So get one. Well, I, I, have, I have a Chevy Bolt also. Uh, in fact, I, I had it in one of the pictures that's in the parking lot. I love it. Um, I've, I, I, I got it like a year ago, April. Um, I have PV on my roof. So I mean, that, that helps in terms of the electricity. They're great vehicles, 
I mean, the problem is that General Motors makes a heck of a lot more money selling pickup trucks and SUVs than they do selling bolts, okay? And so, you know, I'm, I think anybody that drives an electric vehicle gets sold on them. Um, and so we hope we're going to get more charging stations and, and, and people can, you know, invest in them. Um, but, it, you know, it may take a little while. Leslie? Uh, thanks so much. So appreciate that, that emphasis on the urgency and that we can solve it. I mean, that's been missing, and I really appreciate you carrying that. So I, I was going to ask a little bit about methane, um, natural gas. Obviously, Excel's moving in the right direction in a lot of ways, but they just got the commission to approve 380 megawatts of gas turbines. They're existing, but they're still gas turbines. And then we have other groups like RMI and Union China say, well, we got solar and storage coming, so those are just likely to be stranded, and they're kind of get, get in the way of doing the right thing. So I wondered if you could kind of comment a little bit about methane, a little bit about natural gas, and then that possibility for solar plus storage, and what, what your thoughts are along those lines a little bit. And Marie wants you to do it briefly. <laughs> well, look, I mean, natural gas has long been sold as, as this bridge to renewables, okay? And the idea is that, yeah, with a natural gas turbine, you can, you can fire it up and provide electricity when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining. Um, and so for peaking, yeah, I think in the short term that can make some sense. But when arguments are made about, gee, how much carbon emissions you save with natural gas versus coal, they don't look at combustion turbines. They look at the, a modern combined cycle natural gas plant. So there's some games being played about how they do these numbers. And they also ignore fugitive emissions and the emissions of, of methane to the atmosphere. Uh, it depends what time frame you use to figure out how serious those emissions are compared to carbon dioxide. The bottom line is, you know, I tell people under the best of circumstances, burning natural gas puts half as much poison into the atmosphere as, as burning coal does. Uh, and we've got to stop putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, period. So we really need to move to these other things uh, as fast as we possibly can.